Okay, today is October the 17th here at Calvary Baptist Church, and we're going to be continuing our study on the life of Elijah. So let's uh, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 4, and we will um, uh, just have a couple of thoughts, then we'll read the text. I found something interesting, I, at least I find it interesting, but it was a piece published, uh, oh goodness, about 10 years ago from the Washington Post about those skill craft pins. You remember them, the little black ones that would be in every post office and government building chained to a desk, remember those? Mm -hmm. Those are amazing little pens. The, they're made by blind factory workers. They had to be able to write upside down. They had to uh, endure temperature swings from 40 below to 160 degrees above. Um, they were of a specific length. Uh, and because of that, uh, those pens helped Navy pilots navigate a map. It was said they could be used as a two inch bomb, uh, bomb fuse uh, or emergency tracheotomies. It's just amazing when you think of what that little pin could do. I like that because that story, because it shows the extraordinary value of something that most people consider insignificant. For you see, it's the insignificant things in this world that more often than not, God uses to accomplish his purposes, just as an example. The latest poll from the Faith Communities Today survey showed that half of our nation's estimated 350,000 religious congregations had 65 fewer people in attendance on any given weekend. 65 people or fewer, let me get it right. In other words, the church would normally have about 65 people and that is the average that 50 percent of the churches are there or below mm -hmm. when you start looking at uh what churches tend to be the most liberal they're above that at 65 people and below you have some of the most fundamental churches that you'll have in the united states fundamental meaning they adhere uh to the fundamentals of the faith and so God uses those little churches to accomplish his purposes. And this is um, a standard way in which God deals with people. You know what I mean. Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have? Or the Lord asked Moses, what's in your hand? And each time the answer is unimpressive. All we have are five small loaves and two fishes. But in the hands of Jesus, that feeds 5,000 people. Or all I have is a common shepherd's staff. And yet when that staff is placed in the hands of the Lord, it's used to lead Israel out of the land of Egypt. And it's like that in the text that we have before us this morning. When the, and when Elisha asks the widow, what do you have in your house? She answers, your servant has nothing there at all. And then almost as an afterthought, she adds, well, except for a little bit of oil. The little oil that she had was so insignificant that she almost forgot to mention it. But that's all that God needed to solve a problem that most people would consider unsolvable. It's a common thing throughout the Bible that God takes the little things, the insignificant things, the ordinary things, and he uses them to accomplish his purposes, often in extraordinary ways. The little boy's lunch was quite insufficient to feed 5,000 men, but the men needed to be fed, and so those five barley loaves need to be produced. 
The shepherd's staff was insignificant to defeat the army of the most powerful nation on earth at the time. But God's people needed to be delivered, so the staff needed to be used. The a tiny amount of oil that the woman possessed could be sold for next to nothing. But the bills needed to be paid, and she needed money to live on, and so the oil was pressed into service. Do you see the pattern? Mm -hmm. The Bible is quite clear that what we have, God can use mm -hmm. as long as we use it in faith. Because the Bible is also equally clear that God does nothing without faith. The author of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It doesn't say without faith, it's unlikely. Or without faith, it's more difficult. No, it says without faith, it's impossible. Which means, of course, going beyond what our five senses and our reasons tell us is what is necessary. Faith, by definition, is those things that are unseen. Faith goes beyond the numbers that add up on a calculator. Faith allows God to use insignificant things and insignificant people to accomplish his purposes that would not be done without them. In fact, that's what we see in this story before us. Oh, now certainly this story teaches us about the faithfulness of God. It teaches us about his mighty power. It teaches us about his love and compassion. But first and foremost, I think, the story we're about to read is a story about faith. In Matthew chapter 9, we read the story of two blind men who follow after Jesus. And they're calling out to him and they say, have mercy on us, son of David. When Jesus went inside, the blind men followed him and Jesus asked, do you think or do you believe that I'm able to do this? And when they said, yes, Lord, Jesus touched their eyes. And he said, according to your faith, it shall be done to you. It shall be done to you according to your faith. I have the wrong um, reference up there, so I am going to get rid of that. That should be Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. It shall be done to you according to your faith. And that's the idea I want us to remember as we look through this passage. So, Bonnie, if you wouldn't mind, please read for us uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, verses 1 through 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Now, the first thing I think we need to do is just look at the very first verse. And that is that she has a, a woman here has a problem. The wife of a man of the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Well, first we need to look at this person that has the problem. She's the type of person 
if we were to listen to modern health wealth preachers that shouldn't be having problems. After all, her late husband was from the company of the prophets, which means that in the land overrun with apostasy, he was one of the very few who genuinely worshiped the Lord. He worshiped the Lord when it was dangerous to do so. His faithfulness to the one true God made him an enemy of the state with a price on his head. In fact, Jewish tradition tells us that this man was Obadiah, the servant of King Ahab, who hid 100 prophets of the Lord into caves of 50 each in order to protect their lives. The reason he was so poor and had such debts was that he used his own money to feed these prophets and then used all the credit he could muster to continue to feed them. Now, whether or not that's true, I really can't say, but I do know that this is the Jewish tradition. And it makes sense, at least, and it fits the story. Because if this really was Obadiah who had died, it's instructive that his name isn't given. For you see, his earthly status didn't end into the, enter into the equation. His name, his great deeds, his reputation, none of that matters. All that matters is that he revered the Lord. Thus, he stands as an example for everybody that fears the Lord, whether they're important or not important. Well, knowing that to be true, we can draw the following conclusion. If all that was required to bring the blessing of God was to be faithful, he should have been healthy and rich. Instead, he was poor and dead. And this leaves this widow in a precarious position. It was common in the ancient Near East for creditors to take the family members as slaves when the debts couldn't be paid. And certainly there were provisions in the law to help those slaves not be mistreated and there was a time limit you could put on it and so forth. But the fact remains that this poor widow, still reeling from the death of her husband with no visible means of support, was about to have her two children taken from her into slavery. And really, it's difficult, isn't it, to think of a more heartbreaking scene. But we should notice that her husband's faith did not exist alone. Evidently, his wife shared his faith in the Lord, because in her desperation, she cries out to Elisha, the prophet of the Lord. Now, it seems evident as we read this story that she didn't really know what she wanted. In other words, she didn't have a plan already worked out. She had no scheme. She wanted implemented. She recognized the situation was hopeless. But she also recognized that there was help for her in the Lord. Her situation was so bad that only God could help her. So she cries out to him again. And again, we should notice that she makes no recommendation to the actions that should be done. Her petition is simply, help me. Have you ever been there? Honestly. Have you? Where there's no answer that can be found. It's just help me. Well, that's where she is. And if you've ever been there, you know exactly the depths of despair that she was probably sinking into. But in the middle of this, she does exactly what she, she should do. She runs to the Lord and ask for help. And in doing so, she's an uh, a, uh, uh, example for all of God's people. Because remember, it shall be done to you according to your faith is a good model that we can look at. Well, let's go and look at uh, verses two through four. And Bonnie, would you read that for us, please? 
Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Now, as we begin this second section of the story here, we see that Elisha is eager to help her. This, by the way, highlights one of the big differences between Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was used to playing on the big stage before the large crowds and kings and queens. But that wasn't Elisha. Elisha is more frequently meeting the needs of individuals. And this, again, teaches us an important point I don't think we should miss. God uses his Elijahs to accomplish great things on a grand scale. But he also uses his Elishas to meet the needs of forgotten people away from the limelight. We should also notice that God uses his Elishas far more frequently than he does his Elijahs. For Elisha was by far the more frequent miracle worker than Elijah. Well, like I said, Elisha is eager to help. So he asks her, what have you got? What do you got to work with? What do you have in your house? And the woman's answer is telling, I don't have anything in the house. And the implication is that she had sold everything that could be sold. So in her mind, at least, everything of any value whatsoever was gone. And all that was left was a very little bit of oil in a very little jar. Put another way, the only thing she had in her house was so insignificant, it was hardly worth mentioning. But again, as we work our way through the Bible, we find it's the insignificant things, the common things, the ordinary things that God most often uses to show his mighty power. Oh, remember when uh, the Midianites invaded the land like swarms of locusts? God uses 300 men with nothing but torches, jars, and trumpets to defeat them. Or when the Philistines oppressed the land, God used a nobody named Shamgar with an ox goad, which is really nothing more than a pointy stick, to kill 600 of the Philistines and deliver Israel. It was a young teenager with nothing but a stone and a sling that brought down the terrifying giant Goliath. Samson defeated the Philistines with nothing but the jawbone of a donkey. A shepherd's staff was in the hands of Moses when he parted the Red Sea. And beloved, this, this list could go on and on and on. I am constantly amazed at the number of people who think they can't do anything for the Lord because of some lack in their life. They lack money or they lack education or they lack talents or they lack influence and so forth. But whenever we're tempted to think this way, we need to remember that God chooses the foolishness of the world to shame the wise. He chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And so it is here a little bit of oil in a little jar, something she almost forgot about. That's the means of her deliverance. Now, in order to get the right picture in our minds, we need to recognize that in the original Hebrew here, the word jar is an unusual word. It could also be translated flask, and it carries with it the idea of pouring or anointing. Ladies, if you think of a very small jar that looks like a pitcher that has a stopper on the top, about the size of one of your perfume bottles, you get the idea. And in the bottom of this jar, there's a little bit of oil left. 
Now, because of the jar that held this oil, we know what kind of oil this was. This isn't oil used for cooking or lighting of lamps. This is anointing oil, and it's evidently left over from the ministry of her husband. According to Exodus 38, this oil contained liquid myrrh, fragrant, fragrant cinnamon, fragrant cane, and cassia, which was an aromatic bark from one of the trees in the area. So you can see this is expensive oil. Now, even though it was very expensive, we also need to remember there wasn't very much of it. Hardly enough to be noticed, but that's all that Elijah, Elisha needs. And so Elisha tells her to go around and ask all her neighbors for empty containers. And we should notice that there is a different word used here. Don't ask for little anointing jars. Ask for gallon jugs. Ask for buff buckets. Ask for vases. Ask for discarded soda bottles. Ask for anything that can hold liquid. And don't just ask for a few. Get everything that you can find. Then go inside and shut the door behind you because this is a private miracle. Only you and your sons can see it and then start pouring the oil. And as one container is filled, move it out of the way and get the next one. And so that's what she did. And that's when we can see the point of, that I think is the main idea of this story. According it shall be done to you according to your faith. Well, let's finish up the story, verses five through seven, please, Bonnie. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. All right. Now, the first thing we need to notice here is that it took faith to receive this blessing. She heard the promise of Elisha, but before there was any evidence of the supernatural whatsoever, she was required to go and collect containers from her neighbors. And really, can you imagine what that must have been like? She stops by the first house and the woman says, well, sure, yeah, I can loan you some, but what do you need them for? And the widow goes, well, um, I can't really tell you right now. It's a secret, but I'll let you know later. And the next house is the same, as is the next. And the next, pretty soon, everyone is talking. Bored children are following her from house to house to watch this collection of vessels. I wonder if there was any temptation to say, oh, that's enough. To stop the embarrassment and get out of the way of prying eyes. But as we'll see in a minute, the amount of vessels that she collected directly impacted the amount of blessing that she received. I don't know for sure, but I highly suspect that she kept borrowing containers until there were no more to borrow. After all, the lives of her children were at stake, and really, what did she have to lose? And so she goes into her small house with her two boys and closes the door behind her just as she was instructed. And please notice that she fulfilled the command of Elisha to the letter. The situation was too dire to allow partial obedience. And so she obeyed every last detail. By the way, do you obey that way? That's a fair question, I think. Mm -hmm. Is your obedient more of the, oh, well, that's good enough type? This woman obeyed in every respect. And beloved, that's what we need to do. Well, as she stands in the center of her house, surrounded by containers of every size and shape imaginable, 
she starts to pour the tiny bit of oil that's in the very little jar. And when one container was full, one boy would move it out of the way while the other one brought a new one. And as long as they produced empty vessels, the jar poured its oil. Put another way, the containers, the jars, and the vessels were the measure of the oil. The divine power at work in this little house waited upon faith. It was faith that measured the miraculous power of God on this occasion. Had there been fewer containers, less oil would have been produced. And only when there were no more containers to be filled did the oil cease to flow. It was according to her faith, faith demonstrated in her actions, faith proven in the number of vessels collected that it was done to her. Now, before we leave this story, there's one more item of note that needs to be considered. Did you notice when the miracle was completed, she didn't act on her own? She might have guessed that this oil was to be put up for sale to collect the money needed. But interestingly, she didn't presume to know what was best. Instead, she went and she told the man of God what happened and waited for his instructions. He is the one that told her to go and sell the oil and pay the debts and live off the rest. And again, this is faith in action. Evidently, she recognized that our ways are not God's ways. That in the face of such a mighty miracle, she could not rely on her own understanding. She waited on a word from the Lord to know what to do. And again, she proves to be an example for us. It was need, absolutely but it was need coupled with faith that drove her to Elisha. It was faith that prompted her obedience in collecting the vessels. It was faith that prompted her obedience, even in the small things of closing the door and only having her sons with her. It was faith that prompted her to return to the prophet to understand what to do next. Just as Jesus told the blind men who followed him and sought him after their healing, so it's with her. And so it is with us, may I say. It shall be done to you according to your faith. Here is an interesting study that uh, uh, was published in 1983. Lauren Whitehead published an article about the domino chain reaction. You know what I'm talking about. You line up all the dominoes, you knock one over, and the next one knocks the next one over, and so forth, and they all come down in a matter of seconds. The unique significance of Whitehead's study, however, was discovering that a domino is capable of knocking over a domino that is one and a half its times its size. So a two-inch domino can knock over a three-inch domino. A three-inch domino can knock over a four-and-a-half-inch domino. And I'll let you start doing the math from that point on. But by the time you get to the 18th domino, you can knock over the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which isn't exactly fair because it's leaning anyway. But by the time of the 23rd domino, you can knock over the Eiffel Tower. By the time you get to the 29th domino, it can take down the Empire State Building. In the realm of mathematics, there's two types of progression. There's linear and geometric. Linear progression is two plus two equals four. Geometric procession is compound doubling. Two times two equals four. If you take 30 linear steps, you're 90 feet from where you start. But if you take 30 geometric steps, you've circled the earth 26 times. Beloved, this story teaches us that faith isn't linear. Faith is geometric. 
Every decision we make, every step of faith we take has a chain reaction. And those chain reactions set off a thousand chain reactions we aren't even aware of. Most of these reactions, I'm convinced, we'll never see the sight of eternity, but that doesn't make them less real. You might not think you have very much with your one little domino, but that little bit of oil in your little bitty jar, it can do a lot for you when it's placed in the hands of the Lord, coupled with what faith can accomplish. And that's what this story teaches us. Does anybody have any questions or comments at this point on our, on our uh, text? Nope, there's none. All righty, well then, uh, Joel, are you still out there? I'm here. <laughs> would, you close us, would you close us in prayer, Joel? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Shall we pray? Father, we are awed by your grace. The fact that you demonstrate your greatness in such beautiful ways in such apparently insignificant, using apparently insignificant things and people like us is overwhelming. Help us, Lord, to live in, re in that reality, to operate in the assumption that we're dealing with a God who is capable of doing all that we can never imagine, doing things that we can never imagine. Bless us in this next week. Show your might to us, but more importantly, show your might to the world through us as we walk boldly, knowing we have such a God. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, All right. We will see you next week, God willing it. Have a good week, everyone. Uh, have a great one, Bruce. Bye. All right. See ya. Oh, I gotta stop the recording.